The oddest thing going on is we were trying to get our next guest uh, hooked up. Every time he would call us, he would get voicemail. And I said, no worries. I was texting him during the last segment and saying, no worries. I'll just call you. And every time I would call him, it would go straight to voicemail. <laughs> so uh, I wasn't sure exactly what was going on there, but uh, <laughs> I think we've got it rectified now. Kenny, are you with us? Yes, I am. Oh, there there you boy. <laughs> <laughs> little victories, baby, little victories. It's all about that. Kenny Matthews is uh, our guest here, too. And, uh, Kenny, you folks uh, had a press conference yesterday, and uh, I was not able to monitor it live. But in regards to the West Virginia Criminal Law Reform Coalition, there are some things you've been looking into in the state with some problems with our prisons. Can you tell us some information on that? Yeah, um, so... Part of our, of our coalition goals is to um, decrease the incarceration rate for those around the state, as well as outline policies that legislatures, we believe, should get behind to help um, facilitate the growth of our state, um, decriminalizing certain things, as well as overall help make our state um, and our communities better and safer. So some of the policies um, are like having transitional housing actually be funded. Um, there was a bill that was passed uh, last legislative session to allow transitional housing for those that are incarcerated uh, so they could be released. Because um, currently there's 200 people at least that have parole but because of not being able to have adequate housing, are stuck in prison. Um, another policy is our second look sentencing, where we want the legislature to pass a policy where those who have served uh, 10 years or more of their sentence um, have the ability to have a judge to look at the person who they are now versus the person who they were when they were sentenced to deem whether or not um, incarceration is still needed. Okay, and I saw in, in the three goals for your organization, uh, reduce incarceration and recidivism, ease barriers for people in reentry, and prioritize alternatives to incarceration. Uh, so uh, in the Eastern Panhandle, our day report center has gone above and beyond what many counties have done to try and accomplish some of these goals that you're discussing here, and it has to do with uh, people who are in on drug offenses, uh, helping them to get rehabilitated and become tax-paying members of society. Once again, it has served two wonderful purposes. Uh, one, it rehabilitates the person and thereby saves families. And two, tremendously reduces the jail bills that have become debilitating for larger counties such as Berkeley, which were forking over $3 million plus a year in, uh, in costs and incarcerating uh, inmates. Uh, from a legislative standpoint, what are some things our legislature could pass that would help to ease some of these restrictions that are currently preventing people from becoming productive members of society once again? Yeah, um, a lot of it has to do with kind of the sentencing. Um, because, like, for with second look sentencing, um, you have individuals um, and our policy, we're looking at those that were uh, sentenced between the ages of 18 and 25. Um, statistically and, you know, in science, it's proven that those that are considered youthful offenders, they don't have, uh, a lot of times they, their mind isn't functioning or have developed to the point to where they really truly understand all the possible ramifications of their actions. And so you have a, a large contingent of people um, in facilities like Mount Olive and uh, St. Mary's and Huntonsville and other facilities throughout the state that have been incarcerated for decades for offenses that they committed while they were in that youthful offender uh, stage. Currently in the West Virginia Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation, there's over 1,209 or approximately 1,209 individuals that are age 50 and above. Um, and there's 13% uh, of those are ages ranging from 70 plus. 
So what we have thought of is that if we get these individuals that have been incarcerated for um, a large amount of time, get them in front of a judge and say, hey, look at who they are now versus who they were when they uh, committed the offenses, a lot of times we feel that the judge underneath that lens would be able to say, hey, this person is no longer a threat to society. Um, The only purpose of keeping them incarcerated is punitive. There's nothing restorative or rehabilitative about it at this point, and they can increase revenue in the state because they get out, they can potentially get jobs and help support their families and their communities. Um, Yesterday at the press conference, I gave some kind of facts and figures with it. So if you look at the cost of incarcerating somebody for a year and versus uh, the amount of people that are age 50 and above um, that's currently incarcerated in the DCR, that's over $300 million um, that we are spending to incarcerate those people. Now, if you just release 10% of that, you are then bringing in $3 million um, of that money back into the state, back into the revenue that we can decrease the jail population, we can decrease the amount that we spend on people, but increase revenue by having those people work jobs and things like that. When you, Beverly Sharp with the REACH initiative, she does a lot about reentry as well as she holds reentry simulations and talks about the barriers that people uh, experience upon release from incarceration. And there's, she said there's over 1,800 collateral barriers that someone released from incarceration receives. And that includes everything from housing to employment to even voting. Uh, as it states in uh, the legislature right now, if you are released from prison but you're on parole or probation, you do not have the right to vote. So that is a barrier to someone feeling that they're truly made whole post-release from incarceration. So we also want to have um, – a bill passed where it restores the voting rights for everyone released from incarceration, regardless if they're still on parole, probation, monitoring, or anything like that. Um, Our country is founded on the premise of no taxation without representation. So we're releasing releasing people from incarceration and telling them uh, you can work a job, you can pay your supervision fees, you you have to, you know, be an upstanding member of society, but you can't vote for the people to represent you. Kenny Matthews is our guest. He is the West Virginia Economic Justice Fellow for American Friends Service Committee. Matt Miller. Hey, Kenny, back to the second look um, idea and initiative. Uh, would that only apply to uh, those incarcerated for certain crimes, in other words, more, um, if you will, high-profile crimes, a murder or rape or something like that, and depending on the length of a sentence, would, would that person have that opportunity to have their sentence looked at after, say, that 10-plus year period and a judge make a determination at that point whether that person should be let out? Or are we talking more with, you know, a, a, say, a, a drug conviction and things like that? Well, we, uh, as part of our policy, we didn't um, put in there any specific um, crimes. Um, it's just about the time, the length of incarceration. So if you're between the ages of 18 and 25 and have been incarcerated for 10 years, you would have the ability to have a judge look at the validity of your incarceration. Um, as kind of some background to me, I was formerly incarcerated myself on drug-related charges. And my first conviction here in West Virginia, I did five years um, on two possession with intent to deliver charges. And then the second time I was incarcerated, um, I did um, three years and some change on two deliveries of a controlled substance. So I wouldn't have a 
um, being eligible for this type of bill. However, um, part of my own rehabilitation while I was incarcerated was I was part of kind of a mentorship program called the Olive Tree Initiative that was started in Mount Olive, a maximum security prison, by fellow uh, inmates there at the facility. And these were guys with life without mercy sentences, life with uh, mercy sentences, uh, or have had um, an exorbitant amount of time, and they developed a program to help rehabilitate and change the thinking of individuals so that they can be prepared upon release. So if individuals there in the facility can create this program to help you know, their fellow inmates um, better themselves while they're there. And these are guys, some of them have really, uh, at this point, no hope of getting out besides any type of legislative relief. How can we say that there's no redeemable qualities in them or they, that they're uh, still a danger to society? Let me first say congratulations to you in being able to overcome those things and uh, and be doing what you're doing right now. Um, let me ask again, uh, also you mentioned the transitional housing. Um, what type of an expense might that add to our, our judicial system and or our corrections system right now to be able to help provide that for, you mentioned, uh, some 200 folks right now who have parole but can't get out because of that lack of housing? Well, uh, Beverly Sharp with the Reach Initiative, she knows more about the uh, the figures of that. However, I do know that it would be kind of a one-time uh, allotment of funds for that. And then once they're released and they're working, they would be able to pay rent to continue the program and, and continue the expansion. So if we look at it, um, of getting those 200 people out, all right, it, on average, is about it costs the state about $33,000 a year um, to release, uh, to house those people. So a little bit over $6.6 .6 million, if my math is correct, with those 200 people alone. So a one-time payment of, let's say, even that $6.6 .6 million. If we pay that to develop these housing programs, we save the state that plus some after it's been developed and people are constantly released and paying the rent and the upkeep of it. Um, and it decreases the chance of, of violence in the facilities. It, the facilities right now are overcrowded. Um, they, it's no secret that they've had this exorbitant jail bill, which the legislature last year helped with some um, by allowing um, roughly a little bit over $100 million towards the deferred maintenance um, in the prisons. But this is a, a way to make a one-time investment in a program that will continue on, decrease the prison population, increase access to individuals with resources, allow people to maintain their lives in a manner that allows to save the state money and increase tax revenue in the state. I've, I, this, Kenny, this is John Gilstrap. Um, let me add my voice to congratulations for overcoming uh, quite a lot in, in your life, which brings me, I'm going to be deliberately provocative here because I, I think there's a, politically there's a hard pull on this war. And that would be this. To commit a crime is to make a choice. And the choice is it works against the criminals, assuming everybody's guilty, who goes to prison, and that's a different argument. But you make a choice, then you go to prison and you serve the, the time that is assigned. And if, if it's a serious crime, it's a violent crime, where we have a criminal who has harmed another person, and... Um, I'm not sure that the general populace thinks that it shouldn't be punitive as opposed to restorative. What are your thoughts? And I have about a minute and a half remaining, Kenny. Okay. So 
there may be uh, contenders of the population that believe it should be punitive or restorative. However, our Constitution provides protections against cruel and unusual punishment, right? So if you have an individual that has served a whole bunch of time, they've rehabilitated themselves, they've done everything um, within the facility as they are considered a model inmate there at the facility, they've done all the programs, they've attained college degrees, how can we say as human beings that this person doesn't deserve a second chance, doesn't deserve the even just the ability to have their sentence looked at? Who I was when I committed my offense is completely different from the person I am now. And there's a lot of people that have that same type of sentiment that who they were in the middle of the fence is not who they are now. And a lot of times there are so trauma and mitigating factors within why somebody commits a criminal offense. So we need to look at the totality of the issue and not just they committed this crime. And Kenny, on that note, we are out of time. I appreciate yours. Love to have you back on the show again. I hope you come back on. Oh, I definitely will. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Kenny Matthews.